hello everyone. Uh, I'm Damien Tourneau. You might know me as Damzi. Uh, I'm the CTO of Commerce Guys. And I'm here to talk to you about uh, an idea of refactoring how we store stuff uh, in Drupal 8. That's what I call do document oriented storage. So, just to uh, we don't have any, really a lot of time, and um, I realized yesterday that we only have half an hour and not one hour, so I have way too many slides. Um, anyway, we are going to try to go through the gist of it. Uh, so just for the purpose of this conversation, uh, you can hear document here as entity, uh, if you are familiar with the Drupal 7 concept. Uh, at its core, it's basically just a piece of unstructured data. Uh, you can see it as a JSON, for example, just a bit of JSON. Uh, so I, I have four points to make and a vision to present, so I'm sure we are going to, tr to manage to go through the four points. I'm not sure we are going to go, to go through the detail of the vision, but whatever. So, four points, follow me. Um, first, um, when you when you think about documents and what Drupal is, Drupal is a CMS and we store documents. The point of a CMS is to manage content. And this piece of content, for this piece of content, for a CMS, we need fast retrieval. We need to be able to, uh, the, the gist of our load, the main load we have is horizontal load. We want to, lo to be able to load a, a document quickly. So when you visit the node page, the node slash one page, we need to be able to load so this node entity and we want basically all of it. We want to be able to display all the fields that this document carries. Also, most Drupal sites have a relatively low write to read ratios. Uh, most of the time you read something way more than you write it. It definitely depends on the, on the type of site, and community sites tend to have higher write-to-read ratio, but generally you read a ton more than you write. We need, the second thing we need is scalable querying. We need to be able to increase the size, the number of documents we manage, and still be able to query on those documents quickly. Um, scalable, that means scalable to the size of the data, obviously, but also to the number of servers that participate to the processing of a request. So if you, if you start having a really large site, you might want to have several database servers, several front-end servers, and we need to be able to scale um, to those new servers and to the size of the data. The third thing we actually need in terms of document storage is an abstract interface. Why? Because there are a ton of super fun, super great data stores out there that have been specifically designed for exactly what we are looking for, that have been specifically designed for the type of document we manage. I'm thinking about MongoDB, about CouchDB, about many of the NoSQL databases, um, especially those that can actually store documents. Uh, so there are a ton of things out there that can um, do, that are been precisely tuned and precisely designed for exactly what we want to do. So we should be able to use them and we should not be uh, stuck in SQL. Second point I want to make is that, and it's very important, um, the way we, store the, we actually store the data has absolutely no impact on the scalability of uh, our querying, or the scalability or performance of our querying. Why? Because, because of this. Let's call that the Damsey axiom. For every normalized way to store the data, an infinite number of queries will not possibly scale. <laughs> and I'm going to give you an example. Who can tell me what this is? So it's a SQL query, but what is it? Yeah, so that's basically the taxonomy term page. You want to display all the nodes uh, that uh, belong to a taxonomy term, that are tagged by a taxonomy term, and you want to only display the, those that, have, that are published, and you want to order them by sticky first and then created. So that's basically the gist of a taxonomy term page. The problem with that is this. The problem here is that we have uh, two conditions. 
on every side of a relationship, of ev on every side of a join. So the way we store this data, the way we store nodes, the relationship between nodes and taxonomy terms is purely normalized. It's the textbook way of storing that in SQL. We have a node table, we have a taxonomy term table, and in the, in the middle we have a taxonomy term node table that does the relationship between the two. That's a canonical way of storing that. It's perfectly normalized in every possible way, but it cannot possibly scale even if in, in a request as simple, in a query as simple as this one. That's basically the most simple query you can imagine on that type of data set. You, you can do way more, way worse, and you have done way worse on your project. <laughs> the second point is that we don't actually control the way the data is going to be queried. We cannot continue trying to tune the way we store the data because we imagine that it's going to be queried in a different way. And that's best, um, that's best seen in this quote, this large quote from Eaton. That's, uh, you remember the debate when we introduced Field API in core about um, uh, per bundle storage per, and one table per field and one table per bundle? Eaton wrote that. At present, the ability to keep things in a single table is the only thing that keeps a number of high-performance Drupal sites I work with online. And I have to say, Eaton is right. He's wrong in saying that we need per, uh, one table per field. Uh, one, uh, we need to keep the per bundle storage thingy. But he's right in saying that at this point, this is the only thing that keeps us alive. The only, uh, the, the, this type of uh, structuring and tweaking of the structure is basically the only thing that keeps us alive. So, as a consequence, we, there are two consequences of that. The first one is that because the storage has no impact on the performance uh, of the querying of the performance, and because we want fast retrieval, we should store the data in the way that allows fastest retrieval. And there is another consequence we are going to talk about a little bit later. Third point I wanted to make today is that we need to look at what's happening elsewhere, but, um, and I looked at what's happening elsewhere, but, and it's not actually the end of the story, because there is plenty of things we can still, uh, we, uh, we can still improve. Uh, we need to learn from uh, the outside, but there is a ton of things we can do ourselves too. Um, so, the first thing we need to look at is inspiration outside of Drupal, and I know it's scary. So, I looked at two types of tools. The first type of tools are what we call object relational ma mappers. Um, it's a traditional way of storing the documents uh, everywhere else in the world. Uh, in PHP, it's stuff that uh, it's project like uh, Doctrine, um, especially uh, something interesting is the fork for, of Doctrine for managing MongoDB. In the Java world, it's called Hibernate, for example. In Ruby, there, there has been active records that have been around for ages, which is a part of Rails. Um, so those things are um, the canonical way of storing data, but uh, they they don't put any focus on performance. They put um, way more focus on normalizing the data and mapping them to native objects than uh, on the scalability of the, uh, of the querying of those objects. Um, in a way, they are more object-oriented, so they want to map data structure to object, than document-oriented. They cannot store anything you throw at them, if, they, if it's not mapped to an actual object structure. Um, wh what's really interesting is that, is that when you look at, when you search for, for example, active records and performance, or active records and de denormalization or stuff like that, you find absolutely nothing. Uh, it's really interesting. Apparently, we are the only, the only one to have scalability issue with SQL databases. I don't know. <laughs> or there is no big, big Ruby site anywhere. I don't know. Um, the only, the other source of in inspiration is uh, what the Java world has been calling content repositories. Uh, it's originally a Java specification, it's JSR 2.8.3. 2.8, 
Um, and there is currently a port of this thing uh, to uh, PHP that has been initiated by the Flow 3 project. Uh, it's part of the refactoring of Type 3. Um, I looked at that very precisely. Um, the conclusion, uh, I don't have any hard conclusions yet on, on it. Uh, it's a very interesting, uh, it's a very interesting project. It's, it's also very, very complex and for the uh, way more complex than we actually need, than what we actually need. It has no specific focus on performance, and that's a big concern to me because it's already very complex, and uh, making that scale is going to be a, a, probably a bigger challenge than doing some stuff by yourself. Um, so there are discussions going on, uh, and they need to continue, uh, but it's a very interesting piece of inspiration. So there, is, there are also inspiration inside Drupal. Inside Drupal, you can look at uh, 10 years of scaling Drupal. Uh, so the Drupal project is more than 10 years now. And we have come up with ways to scale Drupal. Especially we have come up with, uh, David Strauss has come up with materialized view. Um, we have alternative field storage. So I, uh, I wrote with checks the MongoDB storage. There, there is a Pervernal storage. Uh, there are, I, I have an, um, an experimental Elasticsearch field storage. Well, there have been some work in that area. Um, of, obviously, there is the Entity Cache uh, project from Catch. Um, and uh, also a very interesting project, which is Entity API Metadata, which um, basically adds a schema on top of our Entity Field model so that you can introspect them and introspect it. So all of those things are stuff we need to look at. Based on the, on, on the first three points, I think my, my, fi my fourth point is that we need to implement automatic denormalization uh, of um, our data uh, to guarantee querying performance. It's the, uh, actually the only way to guarantee querying performance. And when I, I emphasize automatic here, because, um, because we do that manually all the time, and that really needs to stop. Um, so the basic idea is to duplicate the data in a form that is easier to query. So I instead of storing the data once, you store it once for in a canonical storage, and you denormalize it, you duplicate it in a way that is easier for you to query. So in a, ways, in a way, for example, um, in which the database engine will be able to construct indexes on, uh, mostly in a single table. Um, so there are plenty of, we have plenty of experience in that. Uh, just on Drupal.org, for example, we have uh, three or four materialized views that powers basically everything. Most of the queries go through materialized views today on Drupal.org. Um, but I was, uh, I was saying we need to stop manually denormalizing. We need to stop implementing manual denormalization ourselves. So just a quick poll here. Do you know how many denormalization implementations we have in Drupal 7 core right now? We actually have five different denormalization. We have the taxonomy index, we have the form index that are completely different, different beasts that are supposed to uh, improve the scalability of taxonomy queries. Uh, we have Tracker 2, since Drupal 7, we have the Tracker 2 project in core that has two different types of denormalization. It has a global and a per user denormalization. And, and uh, it's very important to note that uh, inside the field storage itself, we have a denormalization. So f the, uh, we have two tables per field. We have a current table and a revision table, and this is actually a denormalization. We have a duplication of the... Um, as defined by a duplication of the data to improve query performance. So it's basically a denormalization. So we need to stop doing that manually. So that brings me to the vision. So please don't kick me just yet. Um, the current state of the world is, the current state of the game is this. So it, it all starts with the entity controller we have. Um, the entity controller queries the SQL database to get the, the base fields of an entity. And then it calls via hook, um, hook entity update, it calls the field API to grab fields. 
the field API relies on the field storage to, to load the fields, and the field storage query a field storage database. So it's basically, it's by default, it's the same. This thing and this thing are the same. Uh, but it can be different, and uh, we have a production, uh, we have the MongoDB st field storage, for example, in production in, uh, in a couple of very high-end sites, and it's, works, it's working very well. So this, we have this split brain issue, where we have, uh, on one side, we have the entity thing, and on the other side, we have the field thing. But wait, it gets worse. We added to that entity field query, which is a monster in the middle. Entity field queries queries the SQL database directly if we, you only do um, a property-based query, but it queries, but it relies on the field storage to do the query if you have a field part in the query. So, but if you have a field part and an entity part, for example, you want to uh, precisely you want to get all the entities that have a uh, field of a certain value ordered by a created creation date. In that case, the field storage has to know about the SQL database. So it's basically a, an architectural monster right now, where everything is depending on everything, and the SQL is still very rooted everywhere. So what happened is in the MongoDB project, and the MongoDB project is working for only one reason, is that it's not, only, it's not simply a field storage. It's, it's both an implementation of an entity storage and a field storage. So it implements hook entity update and hook entity insert to be able to actually store the whole entity inside the MongoDB database. So it's basically working around this architectural craziness. So what I suggest is that we move to this. We move to, we still have the entity controller up there. Oh, I forgot to mention that, of course, in core, we have uh, only support for load in the entity controller, and um, everything that is write related, like update and insert, is actually very messy, but whatever. Uh, we are going to fix that at one point. Um, so what I suggest is that we keep the entity controller that, does, that supports full CRUD uh, for uh, entities and that relies on a document-oriented layer that I'm going to describe to actually store the entities. Um, the document-oriented layer uh, relies on a document store, so which will be SQL by default, but could be MongoDB, an Elasticsearch, or whatever, a CouchDB. And what I want to do is to make the field API only a provider of meaning for the field. So the fields are there in the, document, in the entity document, the field API gives them meaning. It gives them a, a schema, it gives them widget for matters, etc. what the field API is good for. I want to remove the whole field storage part of the field API because it's not what the field API is good for. Here we come to the part where you are going to kick me. Um, uh, some details about what I see for the SQL storage. Uh, for the SQL storage, I see us using a, a, a two-part storage, a canonical storage and materialized use. Uh, the canonical storage will be one table per collection, listen um, here, one table per entity type, for example. So one table for node, one table for users, etc. And in that table, I want to store the data as is. Uh, directly in a serialized form. For example, in, a, in, a, in an XML column. It has a lot of advantages to actually use an XML column in that, um, in that case. Um, and I want to store each revision of the document as a different row. So it, in an append-only way, each time you, modif you modify a document, it creates a new revision. Um, associated to this canonical storage, which uh, this can, um, querying this is obviously not going to scale. Uh, it's definitely not going to scale, and the point is not scaling. The point is allowing fast retrieval and normalization of the data. Scaling the querying is the responsibility of the materialized views. And what I want here is one table per view, per view, not in the, in the views module, but uh, one table per query, if you want. 
um, those tables could actually be built using the XML introspection capabilities of uh, every SQL database. Uh, most, of the, most of the database have that. Uh, it's in MySQL starting in 5.1 point something. Um, it has been in PostgreSQL for ages. It's not in SQLite, but we can actually implement it in user space, so it doesn't matter. Uh, I did some testing. Uh, if you take a 10 million rows uh, table with, uh, some, with some XML document in that, doing a full scan of that uh, and extracting data using XPath takes a few minutes. So something like two to three minutes. So rebuilding a matter as you, if we lost it, is something that is an operation that is actually that could actually be made very cheap. It's not cheap as transactionally cheap, but it's cheap as you can rebuild it if you need it. It's not going to take you six hours. Currently, the materials you we have in uh, on Drupal.org, which are uh, PHP based, take six to seven hours to rebuild, and we have about 600k documents. So it's uh, orders of magnitude uh, slower. Uh, those materials view could be either be made permanent or created on demand, depending on uh, the way we see that. Ah, so we still have 10 minutes. <laughs> so we could actually go through the preliminary API, uh, but I can answer questions first. If you do want to leave discussion yeah, uh, I'm going to go quickly through that, uh, not in detail, but um, the way I see it is uh, I designed a, an API based on uh, what uh, MongoDB is doing, which is probably the closest to what we want to do. Uh, basically, you create a document like that. Uh, it's an array uh, of arrays, um, and you can insert it in a collection with collection insert. Uh, you can remove it from a collection with collection remove. Uh, everything is based on UID, so you get a, a UID when you insert the document. You can update the a full document, or you do, can do partial replacement. Um, we can do stuff like uh, you can load a single revision, multiple revision, uh, in batch or, or single, and you can do queries like that. You can do a simple queries like filter, uh, give me all the nodes, uh, all the documents of type article ordered by created date descending, and the result of that is you get a, an iteratable object that you can um, uh, that gives you all the, the real document. But you can do also deep querying, like give me all the documents that are tagged with a given taxonomy term. Um, you can do, you can materialize those stuff. Uh, so you can decide, I, I want to create a base query that I'm going to materialize that has this, the data I need to be able to query per tag. And I'm going to use that differently. Uh, possibly we could allow you to query across joints, across relationships, like querying for the tag name instead of the tag ID. Um, versioning and synchronization. Um, one of the main design constraints here is to allow uh, easy synchronization uh, to kind of solve the uh, staging issue. Uh, so the idea is to use UID everywhere, both for um, identifier of the document and identifier of the revision, and to work in a purely append-only way. So each time you do a modification, you basically create a new revision. Um, and something I'm completely convinced uh, of is that we need to allow tagging of revision in different states, so that you can say, give me uh, query the data store, but only for the latest document, or query the data store for published versions, or query the data store for uh, published versions for site X, if you have a multi-site instance, so that you can do querying across different states. Um, we can discuss the schema less or schema full of this. Uh, we could also implement aggregation like uh, MongoDB style map reduce, and there are a couple of technical issues with that. And I'm done. <laughs> So now, opening the floor to questions. Chicks. Uh, there is just one small issue with this, that uh, the XML functions uh, in MySQL uh, find the one in where you should use buffer. Pretty much uh, the two buffers could be used around find the one dot twenty four or something like that. So you would pretty much maintain a somewhat new find the one for this. Uh, 
just, just to be clear, the first GA of 5.1 is something like 5.1.30. Uh, no, no, the first usable version of 5.1 was 30-ish. Before that, there is even uh, bugs with the query cache, so it's not even usable. Yeah. Oh. Okay, the question was, you are going to mandate a very recent version of MySQL 5.1? Yes. Uh, and I think that Moshi has ac actually has a talk of upping our hosting requirements, and I think it's really a good idea. Um, Krell. Uh, yeah, I'm going to back to you just after that. Larry? No, that doesn't surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> Up until you talk about getting rid of field storage, because one of the nice features of that is, I believe, the ability to store uh, fields in different data stores, so you can have some local, some remote. Mm -hmm. And I don't see how you would do that in this sort of architecture, but that is a feature I think is extremely important for us to be able to you know, take data from a third-party source, enhance it, and then yeah, uh, so the question is, uh, if you get rid of the field storage, uh, you are going also to get rid of the feature of being able to store fields remotely? Uh, that's... Uh, some fields are remote. Yeah, some fields remote and some fields... Um, I am pretty happy to... Uh, the, the way I see it is that this is basically an extension of the field storage, m moving it just one level up to the entity level. Um, I'm I would be happy to throw away the, the feature of being able to store some of the field of an entity remotely and some of some other locally, but you can still be able you will still be able to store full entities in a different in different places. What you will not be able to do is to store a part of an entity locally and part of an entity remotely. And that's where I have a problem with this approach because I think that is an important feature we have to keep. Okay, we need to discuss about that. Uh, there was a question here. Uh, the question was on penniless views. Uh, uh -huh. Because we did a lot of work with penniless views a couple of years back. And then uh, one thing that we noticed was building, rebuilding the view was quite painful. I mean, even with the database of 30,000 nodes, it takes about four hours to, build, to rebuild the whole view. Uh, so are you, are you suggesting that the views are built uh, outside of Drupal from MySQL to Postgres so store directly? Or are you suggesting? So the question is uh, about the performance of rebuilding views. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I mentioned that on Drupal.org we, we are using three or four different materialized views and it takes something like seven or eight hours to rebuild them. Uh, so it's really a pain in the ass. Um, the idea is to use the uh, XML introspection features of uh, SQL databases to speed up the process and in my testing rebuilding a view for 10 million rows should not take more than a few minutes. Right. So it's a different approach than materialize you. Materialize you used to pipe everything through PHP. Uh, that's actually a different approach. Uh, yeah, um, Peter. I mostly like this because it does move us towards a unified API, which I'm 100% behind. Um, uh, is there a way that we can move from what we have now towards this, maybe by putting entity cache in core? Or what do you see in the intermediate state where we could start moving towards this? Um, yeah, I actually gave some thinking to the strategy to, to move towards this. The first step is would be to move uh, so, yes, yeah, the question is about the strategy to implement this, basically. Uh, and is, uh, is uh, moving entity cache to core uh, an interesting intermediate step or not? Um, I actually gave some thinking to that. Uh, to me, the first step to, towards that is to actually move the entity system as a, as a module, and there is already an issue for that. Uh, add CRUD support to that, and as soon as we have that, we basically already have a, con a consistent API. We can modify the underlying stuff way more easily uh, than what we currently have. So yeah, for me, the first step is to actually implement full CRUD for entities. And I'm going to give, to give the next question to Fago because it's a perfect <laughs> transition. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, uh, to, uh, the, the way I presented it, uh, basically the controller is using the document storage to, as, its primary, uh, as its storage. So the controller is basically just a wrapper around the storage. Uh, I think it's probably a good idea to build it as a different system because my um, so the first my first idea when doing this talk was to also use that for configuration. So for the configuration management uh, stuff, if we if we build a sufficiently abstract API, we could possibly use that for configuration. I'm not sure it's a good idea anymore, but that was the initial idea. Uh, I think it's good to keep that separate from the concept of entities in Drupal. The way I see that is that the, the entities give meaning to the document. So document storage is only responsible for storing it. It doesn't care about its meaning. So the, the entity part basically is responsible for uh, giving a schema, in a way, to the storage. So storage is basically an XML blob, and the entity layer gives a schema, a meaning to that. And by the way, I'm, I think it's really a good idea to have a metadata framework in core. Just saying. <laughs> Uh, yes? So, uh, you're talking about XML storage, you're just talking about basically taking a nested array and, and making it into the simplest XML possible? Yep. Okay. You should probably repeat the question because it gets on the recording. Okay, the question was about uh, what do you mean by XML storage? And yes, I mean just a, a very simple serialization of a PHP array into XML. <laughs> yes? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Yeah, no, I think uh, uh, what we need is a system that does that for you. Uh, I'm, pr I'm pretty convinced about that, and that probably means that um, we also need to figure out um, maybe to improve our job queuing system and our background processing stuff, because we might need some more advanced stuff, but yes, the API needs to be, do that for you. You don't have to care about it for a developer. Basically, as a developer, what you are going to do is to implement something like a hook, uh, materialized uh, query info, and you are going to give them, to give the API your queries, and it's going to do everything for you. Larry, again? <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, and you know, taking a single entity type and denormalizing that for a given query is easy, but like one of the big places where you got pure document storage like MongoDB breaks down is use relationships where you want yeah. to you know, join between four different entities. Right? Yeah, de definitely. So the, qu so the question is about relationships um, and cross-entity queries. Um, so that's 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 clearly the the hard place. Uh, no doubt about that. Uh, I've gave some thinking to that. It needs more thinking, but uh, I think we can build an API that allows you to do that and that allows you to materialize those queries transparently. Um, because the 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 the, the more the most typical type of queries we have uh, across relationship is queries like that, where you want to uh, query on a property across a relationship. So you want to, to, to display all the nodes authored by a user named MZ. Uh, so you don't have a user ID, uh, you, only, you, you want to query across the relationship. That's the most typical way of using relationship, and this, the, um, I think we, um, I have a plan to do, that, to do this one. Uh, this one is actually simple. Um, there are other types of, uh, of issues across relationship, and those need more thinking, def definitely. But um, for example, there is one, one of the questions is, do we want to allow you to query for fields across a relationship, and stuff like that? And there are open questions, no doubt about it. But I think that in most cases, we can actually build something that, uh, that works really well. No, we are not going to do that. I, good. <laughs> no, we are not going to. So the, the question was, no, we are not going to, to mandate you to deal with that. Peter. I just 
follow up more on the building of the views. I wasn't really clear on your answer. So, uh -huh. are you envisioning that behind the scenes, Drupal is analyzing the queries transparently and queuing up, you know, materialized views, or that you, as a developer, I think this is the question: you as, do you, as a developer, have to know that I need a a, a view on this query, or? Are you somehow going to have Drupal look at the query and figure that out? So I'm using views and queries uh, interchangeably. So for me, it's, ac it's actually exactly the same thing. Uh, it's a way to query the data. Um, and uh, yeah, the way I see materializing is uh, no, a manual operation. So you as a developer will have to deal with the concept. You will not have to deal with the implementation. You will have to figure out that, for example, if I'm, um, if I'm a module responsible for uh, displaying taxonomy pages, uh, you will have to figure out that you need to build, uh, that the best way to do that is to build a, a materialized view that has all the information you want and use that as a base for your querying. So that seems like still a lot of burden on the developer. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a slight burden on the developer, but I think that, uh, I think that I think that we, make, we, we can make this understandable. And the way I, I envision that in terms of API is to base, basically do uh, sub-queries. So the idea I have is to allow you, uh, from an API perspective, allow you to uh, do a query based on another query. So you already have a filtered list, and you basically sub-query this query. So it's a natural concept for you. You already, you already understand what it means. You just had, we just had to add the concept of materialization on top of that, and you should be okay. <laughs> Not convinced, but okay. <laughs> Need work. <laughs> Any other question? That, that's, that's also true. In most cases, you will not need to build any query yourself. So that's also true. Yes? In Drew's keynote, he said that Drupal is one of the few systems that... Don't believe Drew's keynote. Basically, Drupal is one of the few things that work from the individual hobbyist building a small site on their own to the large big system. Yes. Is someone who wants to build their own personal site still able to use um, this has zero UI implication, and for the performance of small sites, it's probably going to be better. Uh, so if you're on shared hosting, as soon as you satisfy our requirements, uh, your site should actually run better than it does right now. Uh, so it has zero impact on the casual site builder. It has an impact on the developers that wants to start. And one very important thing we have here is that we need to make sure that developers that start developing with Drupal forget about SQL. Yes. If they can't forget about SQL, <laughs> we are okay. If they want to do SQL queries, they should go see another framework. <laughs> yes? Mm -hmm. Are we not risking, assuming that's the part of this trait, uh, overloading the part of SQL that's pretty much the hardest to scale, that is insert, write heavy? Uh, actually not. Uh, that's, a, that's a very good point. So the, um, the, the point is, I think, uh, are we trading uh, select performance for insert for, for, for against insert performance, uh, against an insert cost? And actually we are not. Uh, when you think about it, Currently, we store every field in a one table per field. So that means we have an insert query per field. So if you have 50 fields on a node, we have 50, uh, 50, 50 field, 51 fields, uh, <laughs> 51 queries. And we have 51 insert queries or update queries. And even worse, we have delete followed by insert for the field, which is probably the uh, most horrible thing we can imagine. Uh, here we are storing everything. Uh, the document as is using a single insert or update query uh, in a single table. So we, what we gain here, we are losing it by materializing. But overall, it's not a trade-off. Uh, we are actually improving everything. Yes? So that was kind of going to be my question. Like, <coughs> what's the, how much more writing are we going to be doing 
Yeah. None. 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 No. No, because um, so the the so the question is how much more writing are we going to do through materialization? I think none, and I think we are even going to decrease the right uh, the the right burden uh, because um, this idea of materializing everything is associated to another idea of storing the document as is. So if you want to store a document, you only have one insert query to do. Sorry. Yeah, but uh, you, we can do. It's it's not a cost until you reach the number of fields you were using in the previous model. <laughs> I don't want to cut this oh, up, yeah, it's uh, we are out of time. Yep, that's exactly what I am saying. Yes, and it's actually a very good idea because um, uh, in today's world, it's easier to scale uh, web servers and database servers. So, um, if you remove burden from the database server, it's, it's always for the best. Question. Yes. Query. Yeah. So I'm saying that considering you're saying you have 20 country modules, you will easily outscale the number of current columns or tables with an amount of queries. Yes. Which is why I'm saying you have more rights. Yes, you, you have more rights, but you have less rights because you don't write one per field. Yeah, that no, probably not. Actually, uh, in most cases, probably not. Uh, but yes, it's a it's a it's a trade-off. But what I'm what I was emphasizing is that uh, uh, it's not actually clear if we are going to be more write-heavy or not. Uh, we are, in my opinion, most sites will be less write-heavy uh, yeah. than before. Okay, so just for the record, uh, Chicks was saying that he agrees with me. Just, just for the record. <laughs> okay, we can stop there. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>